much. I uh, want to note here that you have each used uh, a challenge and you have one left. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Constantine. Yesterday, uh, your opponent held a news conference in which he proposed having the King County Sheriff manage the King County Jail in order to uh, streamline operations and to save money. Uh, the sheriff was on hand for that announcement, she, saying that she was not endorsing Ms. Hutchinson, but uh, she was there to support what she sees as good public policy. So would it be good public policy to have the sheriff run the jail? Well, that's a good question. I think it's an important question to ask. But my opponent has already tried to provide the answer before having any of the important details, like the cost, like how we will manage two major employee groups, currently the Sheriff's Deputies Guild and the Jail Guards Guild. What it would take for us logistically to be able to make that change and what benefit it would provide. I said this yesterday when asked about my opponent's proposal, that our decision needs to be data-driven, not driven by politics. That we need to look at the costs and most importantly, the impacts on public safety. The biggest public safety issue we face right now is not who manages the jail, but how do we keep cops on the street? I've proposed a plan that takes money out of council and executive administration and puts it straight into preserving frontline services. My opponent proposed a 5% across the board cut in the general fund that would take dozens, dozens of police officers off our streets. That's not leadership. What we need is someone with the experience managing budgets. And when I managed our budget at the county, I reduced the overall budget by $3 million while dramatically increasing public safety investments. That's the kind of leadership we need from the executive's office, the kind that I will provide. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, I want to follow up on that and that the King County Corrections Guild released a statement today saying that you and Sheriff Rahr had uh, promised to consult with the correction officers before you propose any change in jail management. Guild also expressed uh, skepticism about, about transferring jail authority to an elected official who hasn't worked in the jail. Did you break that promise and how do you respond to that? Absolutely not. In fact, I've been on the phone for the last several days with the, the jail guards and their union. Uh, what we agreed to do was discuss this as move forward together and go through a process. But this is not a new idea that suddenly someone came up with. This has been discussed for years. And in fact, most of the counties in the country have their jail guards and their jail operations uh, done by the sheriff's office. And we can combine these two entities and using the economies of scale, we can certainly, by combining the human resources and internal investigation and other administrative functions, save money. This has been done in Snohomish County and not only increased morale among the jail guards and the jail management, but it's also saved hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. This is a good idea. And one of the problems we have in the county is that the cities do not respect and don't feel respected by county government, but they do like the sheriff's department. And as evidence of that, they contract with the sheriff's department for any number of services throughout the county. And so this is just an extension of that, that we uh, continue this collaboration with good leadership and put the management of the jail exactly where it should be in the law enforcement capability of our sheriff's department. All right, Ryan Bluffman, you have the next question. Okay, thank you. Uh, everyone's talking about next year's budget shortfall of about $56 million. At best, it'll be years before tax revenues are back to where they were before the recession. At worst, the county will never uh, have the revenues it once relied upon. What are your plans three years from now, knowing that the traditional sources of revenue will not be enough? How do you plan to continue to provide critical services, uh, not just next year, but the year after that and the year after that? Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, you first. Well, when sign waving at a Husky game a few weeks ago, a fellow came up to me and said, I work in the roads department at the county. And they're telling us, the union says, you're going to cut jobs. And I looked at him and I said, I am going to save jobs by cutting waste. And he looked at me and he said, waste? Well, I can tell you about waste in the roads department. And he proceeded to tell me three things that go on in the roads department that he considered wasteful. And then he proceeded on into the Husky game. And I thought to myself, what a, a treasure we have in our county employees who are dedicated and really care about the work that they do because they can give us tremendous ideas about cutting waste. And that's where we have to begin. 
we're going to uh, implement a reporting amnesty period so that people feel free to be able to move forward and help solve these problems uh, in finding inefficiencies and waste. We're going to cut the executive's office. It's too big. And we're going to cut the county council's office because it's way too big. Remember, we used to have 13 council members. It was cut down to nine. And uh, guess what? The budget wasn't cut. In fact, the budget has grown. It's grown tremendously. And so the council is going to have to be cut. And so we know that government is bloated. We are going to, we are going to cut that bureaucracy. I talked to someone the other day who's an engineer, and he says, I don't even bother to bid on government jobs anymore at the county because it's such a hassle to work with that bureaucracy. We need to streamline government and right. live the thank way you. the Time. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's go ahead, Mr. Constable. Well, this is another place where experience matters. You know, I put in place with council member Jane Haig the performance measure measures legislation that's pushing our county forward to more efficiency. I put in place the capital oversight with Councilmember Haig, Ferguson, and Phillips that's helping us reach out over the executive branch and make sure big projects are being managed properly. I, with Councilmember Dunn, forwarded the whistleblower legislation that, like your reporting amnesty, allows public employees to come forward and report wrongdoing, report inefficiency, and not fear retribution because we want our employees to be part of the solution to bring forward their best ideas. And I sponsored the hiring freeze to stop King County from hiring more people in a time when we need to be cutting back. I put in place that hiring freeze at the County Council the minute I was unanimously elected chair this year. And because I did that, we were able to cut over $800,000 from Council administration and we cut executive administration by a greater amount and put that into saving frontline services for the people of King County, such, such as sexual assault resources and domestic violence prevention. You know, we need our workers to be part of the solution. And that's why today I proposed having the cost of living adjustment range between zero and six percent rather than two percent and six percent. Right. We'll be taking Thank that you. up immediately. Time. Amy Ray. King County Metro is facing a projected $213 million shortfall over the next two years, raising the specter of cuts in service and higher fares. Please tell us about the last time you rode a Metro bus. Which route was it? How was the service? And did it give you any insight into how to address the Metro budget deficit? This goes to Mr. Constantine. Yes. I ride Metro buses every day in our downtown core. Uh, I use them as part of my daily work getting around downtown. and. Uh, it is uh, in the free ride zone, uh, very crowded, very busy, uh, critical part of our regional transportation infrastructure. I'm proud to have supported for the people of this county uh, investments in transportation and transit choices that allow them to get to work and get back home again, that give everyone the ability to access all the economic and educational opportunities that our region provides. That's why on the Sound Transit Board, I pushed to get that first section of light rail open, and we did that successfully this year. Then worked with my colleagues and negotiated to get Sound Transit 2 on the ballot, and it passed overwhelmingly. And right now, as chair of the Regional Transit Committee, I'm working with leaders from across the region to reduce the sales tax caused uh, deficit in Metro, caused by the decline in sales tax revenues this year to make sure that any cuts that are needed are made fairly and when service is restored it's done based on data and not based on old political divisions. That's the kind of leadership we need in King County. People with knowledge and experience, people who have the values of providing transit choices for our citizens. I'm the candidate who can do that in the executive's office. Susan Hutchison, go ahead. I live on a bus line and I would have loved to have taken a bus uh, downtown to my job over the last 25 years. But unfortunately, I would have had to change buses twice in order to do so. And at midnight, I decided that that was not a wise thing to do. But my children, my boys, have ridden the bus many, many times, as do lots of teenagers, because they learn that system very well. You know, our bus system is one of the most expensive in the country. And one of the things we have to do in order to make it work is to use benchmarks from other bus systems throughout the country and even the world to find better ways to streamline and, and make efficiencies. 
A recent audit on our own bus system found that if we just connected the dots a little bit better and uh, made more efficient routes, we could save about $20 million a year, which is a great savings. We also need to uh, work on fare enforcement. And I've talked to bus drivers about this because they certainly know about fare enforcement. It's, been, it's believed that we have about uh, a couple million, if not more, dollars sitting on the table every year because of lack of fare enforcement. I think our bus drives, drivers, because they're there where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, have got a lot of insight and I want to have an advisory board of, of transit drivers to help us make decisions. You know, one thing about our bus drivers is they hate congestion more than anyone because unlike the rest of us, they have to stay on the same routes and they can't change the time of day they travel. So, you know, ultimately, we have to fix congestion, and that's the way we're going to get right. buses Thank moving, you. too. Okay. Thank you very much. Ryan Glenn. Thanks. Well, because of the economic downturn, Sound Transit is facing a $3 billion shortfall during the next 15 years. This means that the Sound Transit Board will have to make tough decisions to control expenses and lower costs without cutting service. As, a, as King County Executive, you're responsible for appointing 10 of the 17 members of the board. Who would you appoint to the board, and would Bellevue get a seat? And how do you see Sound Transit expanding in the future? Uh, Ms. Hutchison, you first. Well, I love light rail, and like many people who've traveled a great deal throughout the country and the world in metropolitan areas, I've ridden it a lot. And of course, the value is being able to get from point A to point B without getting stuck in traffic. And uh, in 1996, we made a promise to our voters who expected to open light rail in 10 years with a route that started at the airport and went all the way to UW. It took 13 years before we could open a sound transit line, and it is still not all the way to the University of Washington, and it was way over budget. And my opponent proudly says he served on that sound transit board for a very long time. Yes, indeed, it is a very important role that the county executive has in appointing the members of the Sound Transit Board. And as, they, as the terms come up, I look forward to appointing the first opening, which will be this January, to someone from Bellevue. Uh, because the next spur is going to be the Bellevue line, we need to make sure that we have the proper representation from Bellevue. And there's a lot of resentment uh, in that very large retrop metropolis toward the fact that they haven't had the representation that they needed. And this is part of the change that I'm going to bring as your King County Executive, is I'm going to respect, and I do respect, the elected leaders of our cities throughout the county. We're going to collaborate, we're going to work together, and we're going to have a new day as this county starts to uh, respect uh, those in the outlying areas of this county. Mr. Constantine, go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, this is a great question because sound transit and light rail is one of the critical ways in which we are laying the foundation for what our region will look like in the next generation and the one after that. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Susan, but I joined the King County Council, let alone joined the Sound Transit Board after Sound Transit had already turned the corner on its initial problems. Uh, I was proud to chair the Transit Oversight Committee, and that committee delivered to Sound Transit proposals for hundreds of millions of dollars in savings over the next couple of decades. By building our own facilities, by putting work out to bid, by making sure we have standardized fixtures and equipment in our stations. That's the hard work that needs to be done in order for the citizens of this region to get the best bang for the buck, to get what they voted for. You know, I would appoint a representative from Bellevue because Bellevue is our second largest city, is critical, critical not just to our transit future, but to our entire economy. And when we expand Sound Transit, we'll do what we said we'd do when we put this on the ballot last time. The next phase, we'll take transit north to the county line. We'll go to Redmond, to Issaquah. We're going to make sure we get all the way to Federal Way, and we are going to take transit to West Seattle and Burien, as well as take it to Ballard. We are working hard provide the infrastructure for a new economy. Sound transit is a fundamental part All of that. All right, thank you very much. Um, within the last week, uh, both of you have had to deal with complaints uh, filed with the Public Disclosure Commission. Uh, Mr. Constantine, the PDC is investigating whether your campaign treasurer, uh, Jason Bennett, coordinated activities between your campaign and a political action committee. Such as some Democrats have filed a complaint uh, with the PDC claiming you failed to disclose the use of your campaign headquarters, uh, a house in Seattle, as a campaign expense. Uh, will both of you please set the record straight for us 
on, this, uh, on these matters right now. Mr. Constantine, you go first. Absolutely. I'm proud of my long record of excellent public disclosure work by my campaigns. Uh, when I was in the legislature, the Seattle Times bothered to go through and figure out who had done the best compliance, and I came out number one out of 147. Uh, I uh, believe that uh, this complaint is a red herring. It's a distraction from the real issues of the campaign. It will be dismissed. It all boils down to whether the guy who's the president of the company providing treasury services, which has nothing to do with the rest of the campaign, sent out a Twitter message inviting people to come to one of many fundraisers. My opponent has just had over 80 public disclosure complaints filed against her, including the use for free, apparently, of an office in a very expensive Laurelhurst home, and the inability to explain $20,000 in apparent expenditures from the primary election. If true, those are incredibly serious problems, and they need to be investigated by the Public Disclosure Commission. I want to tell you that in my work as an elected official, as well as as a candidate, I have been open and straightforward with the people of King County. My opponent has not. I think it is critical that people ask the tough questions. Who are you as a candidate? What are your values? Who are your supporters? When you ask those questions, there's one clear choice in this race. And you will choose me as the best candidate for executive. All right, thank you. Mrs. Hutchison. Thank you, Enrique. This is a very serious violation of the law that my opponent is being investigated for. And it involves the coordination between his campaign and an independent expenditure of attack ads, false attack ads against me. What has happened could affect the outcome of this election. And that's why it's so serious and needs to be investigated. On the other hand, the uh, recent allegations by the Democratic Party of 81 violations were looked at yesterday by the PDC and seen for exactly the political gamesmanship that they are. In fact, they immediately dismissed 78 of those. And the other three, we are working with them to provide the information they need. You know, most people who run for office and currently are running for office, work out of their homes. In fact, when I started this campaign, I worked out of our house. And when my campaign manager moved into his house and uh, had more room, we moved our campaign into that area. There is nothing against the law of using a residence to run a campaign. It's been done since campaigns were run. And so I'm not the least bit concerned about these allegations, which again are politically motivated and intended to try to embarrass our campaign. In fact, because of these little administrative errors, none of that will affect our campaign or right. the outcome Thank of this you election. Thank you very much. All right. Amy Rayl. This is a nonpartisan race, but the candidates that you've supported say something about your approach to governing. Ms. Hutchison, you donated $500 to George Bush in 2004 and $500 to Mike Huckabee in 2008. Mr. Constantine, I believe you donated $250 to Dave Ross, a political novice, uh, in 2004, and you've also donated to Republican Luke Esser on the state level. How do these donations reflect your own policies and approaches to problem solving? This goes to Mr. Constantine. Well. Uh, I donated to a lot of political candidates, and you've selected a couple interesting ones. My uh, donation to Dave Ross is because I think he represents a lot of what's best in our political discourse. He's thoughtful. Uh, he's moderate. Uh, he believes in hearing people out and providing the time for a complete conversation to happen. I appreciated that in him as a, a radio host, and I thought that would be a good quality in an elected official. Uh, I donated to Lou Kasser. Uh, because we're good friends from uh, my time in law school. He and I went to law school together, and as some of you may know, Luke Esser is the chair of the state Republican Party, and a former uh, elected office holder. Uh, I believe that my contributions show that I'm someone who can work across ideological bounds, work with people across the region, just as uh, is shown by the 50 nonpartisan elected officials who have endorsed my candidacy. Uh, they are people who understand that we need someone who's level-headed, serious-minded, has experience, and has the proven ability to sit down and solve tough problems. 
Uh, I have been able to work with dozens of leaders over the years on solving the most vexing problems facing us. And I recognize that, that those are not Democratic or Republican problems. They recognize that too. That's why they're endorsing me. All right. This is nice. Well, when I was a journalist, as you know, uh, we don't contribute to political campaigns. And so when I ended my career, uh, I began to respond to all of those uh, messages that we got in the mail or phone calls. And uh, one of them was from a friend of mine who said, let's go hear Mike Huckabee speak. He's a popular governor from Arkansas. And at that point, nobody had really heard much about him. And she said, he's got innovative ideas. And this friend of mine is, uh, has done a, a lot of politicking. And so I said, OK, I'll go with you to that lunch. And I wrote the check. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend the lunch. And so uh, that is the extent of my, uh, my check writing for Mike Huckabee. Uh, I have supported a few candidates locally, and I've supported a few candidates nationally. And uh, some of them are Democrats, and some of them are Republicans. I think I'm like most of you, which is that you don't tie yourself to a party, but you like to support people because you believe in them, and you believe they're the right ones to serve the people. And I think that's one of the reasons why I have such nonpartisan support, or rather partisan support, as I've mentioned earlier, with Democrats and Republicans who are standing by me and believe that I am the best candidate to run this county. And I'm grateful to them and will serve them as a nonpartisan. Divisive politics doesn't work, and everybody knows it. All right, thank you very much. I think we have a challenge here. Go ahead, Mr. Constantine. Well, thank you. It's your uh, final challenge. It's my way. final challenge. Uh, I believe that my opponent's contributions to George Bush to the very conservative and anti-choice Mike Huckabee, uh, to the BIAW's PAC, which spent hundreds of thousands of dollars attacking environmental policy and the, the candidates who support environmental policy in this state, say a lot about who she is and what she believes in. You know, just a week or so ago, my opponent appeared at the Washington Policy Council dinner, uh, and she uh, endorsed their conservative positions as she did the year before when she stood up and endorsed their book. They called for things like increasing class sizes, slashing the minimum wage, and eliminating environmental protections, and it called light rail socialistic. She said everyone in that room should read that book. She said that it was uh, something that would make you smart. All right, Tom. Susan Hutchison, go ahead and respond. Well, I'm happy to defend the Washington Policy Center because it's one of the great public policy think tanks in our region, and it's utilized in Olympia by both Democrats and Republicans, and often very praised for their hard work. In 10 areas that they study of public policy that affects our region and our state. And uh, just because I suggest to a group of people, in fact, almost a 1,000 at that particular dinner, that they read their public policy manual, which you have misquoted, uh, doesn't mean that I endorse every idea. I tell people to read the Washington Post, and it doesn't mean that I endorse everything they say, or the Wall Street Journal, for that matter. It doesn't mean I endorse everything they say. But my opponent is a foreigner to the marketplace of ideas. He can't accept anything that isn't in his narrow area. And I like to learn from all the various ways of thinking around us. And that's how you make good decisions. All you right. hear what everybody Time. has to say. Thank you very much.